My advice to Francois Rue was this. If there is contact from an accused, then um, th there has to be consideration as to whether the counsel should then in there say, stop, you may be in danger of losing your right to retrial. Uh, in my view, the, the, the accused should be warned, uh, advised very clearly that he may lose his right to retrial if he seeks to engage with counsel. This is something they haven't resolved. It may well be the defence office can speak to the accused and advise them, or maybe the court. But um, there are lots of questions. We, the court hasn't actually started yet, but this is one particular ethical or procedural problem that's certainly causing them some concern. Um, criticism of the in absentia provisions, very briefly. These are very controversial. Um, they, are contra they were controversial <coughs> even, indeed, when I was in Lebanon. It was apparent that um, it may well have been the, the tribunal was popular for the first year or two, but in the last year or so, I don't know if Stephen would agree, and certainly um, there is a lot of concern nationally because the, uh, the all that effectively the country wants is economic stability. And you now have the, the ex-premier whose assassinated son uh, is now a, a premier in a coalition government with um, Hezbollah. Who, who may well be, in due course, <coughs> the individuals who are put in the dock. So there is an uneasy um, peace at the moment. And whilst it's a very beautiful country, it's a very dangerous one. And it's certainly controversial there. But it's very controversial internationally as well. And reading up on the subjects, international commentators have made a number of criticisms of, of, the, of, the, of the statutes and the provisions. Well, firstly, A, the provisions amount to a violation of human rights norms. Article 14, for example, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. One of the provisions is that there is a right to be tried in your presence. So for us common lawyers, you may say, I'm not going to allow the client I represent to be tried in this way. And you, you may seek to challenge the jurisdiction. You may seek to challenge the rules and regulations. Uh, and indeed, you may, you may pray and aid the provisions of Article 6. Can you have an effective defence? Can you strongly, properly represent your client? His rights and interests, which is the key phrase, rights and interests, where you have no accused, you have no instructions, you have no access to him, as may be the case. It may be that your client is somewhere in Iran, he may be in Syria, he may be uh, somewhere held by his brother, who knows? So that's one criticism. A second one, um, which people comment on, is the criticism that if, there is, if you do attend an initial hearing, or if you do attend an initial video link, and then you leave it, you leave the pre-trial for a year, during the trial for uh, a year you have no part whatsoever, by virtue of your brief appearance in The Hague, whether by video link or in person, you have lost the right to retrial, according to Rule 104. Third point. Circumstances where an accused are prevented from attending by a state. Well, is it right where there's some evidence that an accused, however unlikely this may seem, might be willing to attend, that there should be a trial where it's quite apparent that a state is holding an accused against his or her will? This is not a, a fanciful possibility. The fourth criticism, the set of rules has been argued to encourage non-participation by accused. Uh, and so... Um, for example, it has been argued that by virtue of Article 22, it will encourage, encourage miscre miscreant accused to play tactical games. Why should you appoint, if you're an accused and you find out there is effectively an indictment for terrorism and state ass assassination, would you want to engage with the tribunal? Would you want to appoint a counsel? If you do, you lose the right to retrial. If you don't appoint counsel, and you let them appoint counsel for you, well then, the trial can go on for a year or two. The tribunal itself only has it as a three-year mandate, and who knows whether that will continue. Um, so it may well be that certainly some miscreant accused might say, I'm not going to engage in the process. Let me move on. Um, the role of defence counsel, I'll keep this very brief. Um, it will depend, of course, on what the relationship is you have with your client. You may have a relationship where there's direct communication between you and an accused. Set up some of the possible scenarios where accused chooses you, or you're appointed by the tribunal, or you're selected during the trial. 
if you are selected during trial, in fact, they could begin proceedings de novo, or you could just um, go again. Second option, where there's communication um, between counsel and defendant through a third party, if you're in that sort of circumstance, you want to be very careful indeed. Um, these are very dangerous political um, <coughs> trials, and um, you may, you will have to be very careful who you choose to be on your team. And if you are using intermediaries to have access to your client, you want to make sure who you're using. If you have, if you're interviewing your client at the end of a video link, if he is in Tehran or wherever he is, you may want to be confident that there aren't members of the state present or the police present at the other end of the video link when you're trying to advise your client. Third situation, where there's no communication. Where there's no communication, you may be in a situation, I suppose, we're used to sometimes, and sometimes we might agree it's easier without a client sometimes in, in trials in this jurisdiction. And we often say they are our, their Western enemy. And now, the tribunal envisages for this, and where you have a situation where um, you have no contact whatsoever, the defence office can appoint where there are difficulties, the use of amici, curai, standby counsel, duty counsel, and um, indeed the other day um, I was asked to um, advise the defence office in The Hague where they were considering the use of duty counsel. Um, the, 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 crown, the, the prosecution were considering a reenactment of a one-ton bomb explosion and they wanted uh, me to come up with uh, an explosives expert. Um, anyway, so there are provisions for the Defence Office to, to introduce various um, different means um, <coughs> of other counsel where you yourself may be in difficulty. And finally, I pose the question, will the STL ever see any cases? Will there's lawyers? We hope so. <coughs> One person who may know the answer better than others, this gentleman, this is Hassan Nasrallah. He is a Hezbollah Secretary General. And I just finished by saying this, which might give us some hope that there will be accused going to The Hague, or at least their case is going to The Hague, even if they are not. Um, it has been reported we, um, widely in the, in the media, in the world's media, whether it be true or not, that um, the Premier, the assassinated Premier's son, had a conversation with Hassan Nasrallah, who has indicated he understood that certain ex-former, no, exiled members of Hezbollah, so nothing to do with Hezbollah, part of the government, may, may be called upon. And we wait to see whether that happens. And if it does, then no doubt certain of us will be putting teams together. Thank you.